Okay, welcome back. Uh, I guess I was incorrect about the book having it section 14.7, so starting on the next video, I'll just kind of talk about something that I think is relevant with PDEs, but for this video, we are on 14.6, and that is the kind of the last the solution to the last classical PDEs. So your classical PDEs are the heat equation, the wave equation, and Laplace's equation, or sometimes the Poisson equation. And we worked through the other two in the last two videos, and today we're going to work on the wave equation. And we call it the wave equation because it describes the motion of waves through a medium. And the book's saying something like plucking a guitar string, uh, that would be like a one-dimensional, one spatial dimension wave equation because the, the spatial direction of a guitar string is only one-dimensional. You can only move in one direction on a guitar string. Similarly, if you hit a drum head, that's actually two-dimensional. It's the two, two spatial dimensional wave equation, and there's still the time dimension sitting around because the drum head is flat, and so it can, the, the, the waves can move in two, two dimensions there. So the, the equation which models this, um, and I'm a little bit confused as to why uh, the author has switched from the Laplacian to the gradient dot itself. These are the same things. So this, recall, this is delta the Laplacian. So it's up to you which way you want to interpret that. I usually interpret it as delta. It's much more common to see it as delta in the wave equation. Um, and the other terms here, we have c squared. And there's a, a very valid reason why he's using C. The author's using C. This is the speed of the wave squared. So C being the speed of light in uh, you know in Einstein's equations, uh, C is the the the, prop the wave propagation speed. Um, and so you know oftentimes we'll see a C squared. Sometimes we'll see omega as well, or omega squared. But uh, that's a that's a common way to think about the. Um, the wave equation on the right hand side, F here, is still a forcing, as always. So any terms which uh, are their own functions, they're not the functions we're solving for. In this case, we're solving for U. Um, if it's if it's its own function and it doesn't have any derivatives on it, that's going to be a forcing. So it's kind of isolated by itself and it doesn't have any derivatives on it, that's always going to be a forcing. So in this case, you know, if that's non-zero, it's basically like we have a guitar string, except for some reason we're shaking the uh, guitar in addition to plucking the string. Um, you know, that's going to be, it's going to be common in much more uh, real life physical situations. I'm sure if you've been to the gym, you've seen the people waving the big ropes against the wall, creating waves, um, and they're forcing the waves, right? The, uh, the motion of the arms at the edge of the ropes is forcing the waves to be created. So that's what a, another example, maybe of a forcing with a wave equation. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of the, the equation generically. And for this lecture, we're going to be thinking about the one dimensional wave equation and source free, uh, when they say source, that's the same as a forcing. So, you know. If I'm shaking the ropes against the wall, that's that's a source for a wave to be created, which is the same as a forcing. So a source-free wave in one spatial dimension. Um, so we're just restricting ourselves to x here, not x, y, z, or something like that. So just in x, just in t, we're going to let it go equal to 0. We're going to see if we can solve this. And rather than going through the book solution, I'm going to go through my own, because then you can see it actually worked out, rather than me just relying on the book. So I'm actually going to do this two ways. Two ways of solving wave equation in 1D. That's my cat on her scratcher. Happy kitty. So the first way we're going to do this is with separation of variables. Okay, I'm going to appease my cat. Okay, I'm back. So the separation of variables, which is what we, we've seen already for the, uh, actually both the Laplace equation and heat equation. Um, and then a second way we can actually solve this is using something, uh, a very special change of variables. So I'll start it out by just calling this change of variables. But in particular, this this particular change of variables is due to somebody named D'Alembert, who's French. So a lot of times if somebody's referring to a solution to the wave equation, they'll refer to D'Alembert's solution. And that's why I think it's something very important. The book does not describe this one. And I want to because it's a, it's a very, very common one. Um, that a lot of other people were, will refer to, and you know you should know that then if other people are referring to it. So let's go both ways. Let's uh, recall our equation was partial partial t squared on u minus partial partial x squared on u is zero. And if I want to, I can rearrange this to say that partial squared partial t squared u equals partial squared partial x squared u. And in this form, it's a little bit easier to talk about change of vari or separation of variables because we're going to assume, this is kind of the trick of separation of variables that you maybe recall from before, that my function of two variables is a function of each variable independently. And then we multiply them together. So that's your classic uh, 
separation of variables technique. And then if we do this, it's pretty easy to calculate two derivatives in time because the derivatives in time only see the function of time. And so I recover phi and then two derivatives on psi. And then similarly, if I calculate some derivatives in space, they only see phi. So I have two derivatives on phi and zero on psi. Um, and then if we jump back to the assumption that these are actually equal to each other, so we set that equal to that, we recover that phi x psi double prime of t is phi double prime of x psi of t. And then kind of your classic chain of variables choice from that point is to divide by the original product of the two functions. And that sends us to, once things cancel, because the phi's cancel here, the size cancel here, it sends us to psi double prime t over psi t is phi double prime x over phi x. And I'm gonna give myself a little bit more space at the top. And uh, this, this, you recall from our heat and Laplace loss equation sections, um, at this point, since we know the left-hand side cannot depend on x, and we know the right-hand side cannot depend on t, they both have to depend on an independent variable, lambda, and I'm going to give it negative lambda. So they both have to depend exactly on this other uh, constant in x and constant in t, but it itself is perhaps a variable, negative lambda. And so I get two ODEs back from this. I get um, the first ODE, psi double prime t over psi t is negative lambda. And if I rearrange this, rearrange, this gives me psi double prime t is negative lambda psi t. And I have solutions. If you jump back to your um, ODE's chapter solutions, these are no different than what we've seen in the past. Psi of t is c1 cosine root lambda t plus c2 sine root lambda t. And I'm going to give myself more space to find phi. Oh, Jill. Jill's the name of my cat. Give myself a little bit more space. Run the same song and dance for phi. Negative lambda. I can rearrange. Ah, you'll notice I got my variables wrong. Variables are definitely x. Rearrange, I recover phi double prime of x is negative lambda phi x. And that gives me solutions of phi of x is c1 cosine root lambda x plus c2 sine root lambda lambda x. And so what have I found? Well, I found psi as a function of t. I found phi as a function of x. And I'm going to multiply those to recover my answer. All right, we're going to recall that the, we assumed that the solution was just the product of these two. And so if I give myself one final amount of space here, this feels just like an actual whiteboard where I erase it periodically. So my final solution, u of x t, which happened to be phi of x psi of t, I'm just going to multiply them. And if I do that, then I, uh, I'm going to recover uh, some interactions here where I'm just going to label it c1, c2, c3, and c4. This is after foiling. So after foiling c1 cos root lambda x cos root lambda t plus c2 cos root lambda x sine root lambda t c3 uh, sine root lambda x sine root lambda t and my last cross terms I'm missing are sine root lambda x cosine root lambda t. And so to be a little bit less distracting, I'll erase that. I'll erase that. And there is u of x and t. So there are four terms. There are different interactions of x's and t's and cosines and sines. Um, I want to comment really quick because to see where we're headed, to see the second solutions. When I said I was going to solve this two ways for all of you, to see the second solutions under trig, 
identities. Identities. This can be rearranged to um, C1 cosine root lambda x plus t. C2 cosine root lambda x minus t. C3 sine root lambda x plus t and C4 sine root lambda x minus t. So we have this interaction of pluses and minuses in, of x's and t's inside the cosines and sines. So we have the ability to rearrange it like, uh, like that. And there's actually a good reason to do that. Um, it's not necessarily only the d'Alembert solution, but, but we're gonna see that the good reason to do that starts with the d'Alembert solution. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna clear the whiteboard and rewrite our original ODE or PDE. Partial, partial t squared on u minus partial, partial x squared on u equals zero. And now let's go with this d'Alembert style. So if we run the d'Alembert solution approach, we define new variables. I'm gonna define the first one I'm gonna call s and that s is gonna get defined as x minus t and I'm gonna define y as x plus t. Okay, these are those x minus t's and x plus t's we were seeing in the previous solution. Um, in this setting, we have something like you know, the differential in s is dx minus dt, the differential in y is dx plus dt. And I'm gonna skip the, the computation of this, the next thing I write down, but you can think pretty easily you can you should be able to see how it comes from uh, the relationship between the differentials we can convert this converts the PDE into partial partial y partial partial s on u is zero um, and the maybe one round of intuition as to why you can do this is I can convert the PDE first to partial partial t minus partial partial x times partial partial t plus partial partial x u equals zero. And so under that, that definition, you can kind of, you should be able to see how, because if I had foiled, if I foiled um, this out, I would recover the original PDE. Um, so you should be able to see how that kind of leads to this, making this change of variables for S and Y, we get, uh, we get the new PDE that just looks like this. Because this is basically partial partial Y, or partial partial S, and this is partial partial Y. So maybe I wrote them in a bad order, but um, you get the idea. So this is where d'Alembert comes in, and then and then we run the separation of variables. In the y and s uh, variables. So to run separation of variables in y and s, we assume we have a we have a function of phi, which is only a function of y, a function psi, which is only a function of s, and then partial partial y. Uh, partial partial s of u just gives me uh, phi prime y psi prime s and if this is equal to zero it means at least one of the two terms on the left equals zero right you can only have something equal to zero if something on the other side is also equal to zero it doesn't not both of them have to be equal to zero but at least one of the above is zero. So one of these has to be zero. Well, that gives me two ODEs again. And in particular, these are much easier than ODEs. But the first one is phi prime of y is zero. Well, that just means that phi is a constant. Call C1. If psi prime of s is zero, that gives me that psi is a constant. And so u being a product of the two of them in y and s is either a constant times psi or it's a constant times phi and in fact it's it shouldn't be that hard to figure out that this or can be reinterpreted as a plus the plus sign so that's the solution in 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 uh, the s and y variables but if i decide to convert back out of s and y variables this actually says that u happens to be a sum 
give myself a little extra room. U of X and T is just a sum, C1, psi of S, which is X minus T, plus C2, phi of X plus T. So in fact, uh, we get a little bit more general here, and this is why I was saying the D'Alembert solution is maybe a little bit easier to understand. Uh, psi and phi can be anything. Psi and phi can be any function. They just need to have the special property that what gets put into the functions is x minus t and x plus t, respectively. And so this gives me like a broader class of solutions. You'll, no you'll have noticed in the last cases, since uh, lambda was free to choose, that was also an infinitely large class of solutions. This one's an infinitely large class of solutions that's a little bit easier to work with. And so I actually like the d'Alembert solution better. D'Alembert solution. I would write this one down if you're going to if you're going to write something down, even though the book has something else. I would say this is the D'Alembert solution to the one-dimensional wave equation. Okay, let's jump back to, to the book then and move down. They're going to recover the sine and cosine version here. There's your uh, C1, C2, C3, and C4. The last C should be a C4. Sine and cosine solution, which is perfectly valid, but I like the D'Alembert solution better. And then, and then let's work on a particular solution. So Let's actually grab some boundary conditions, initial and boundary conditions, and see if we can fit a function to that. So grab a domain, zero to one in X. That's the, those are the domains in X. The initial condition we're gonna say is sine of pi X. And then the, um, the initial velocity, because we're two, we have two derivatives in time. So we need an initial condition, initial value and an initial velocity. So the initial value is sine, the initial velocity is zero. And then the boundary conditions being uh, zero as well. Let's, let's try to approach this using using the, uh, the D'Alembert solution. And we'll see why maybe the D'Alembert solution is, is a little bit useful. So, so using D'Alembert, we start with phi x minus t psi x plus t. And if we evaluate this at zero, we have just phi of x plus psi of x has to be equal to sine of pi x. And that's the initial condition, the initial value. And then if I use the initial uh, derivative, I need to take a partial in t. And in doing that, I get that uh, partial partial t of u is uh, negative phi prime plus psi prime. And if I evaluate that at zero, I get that partial partial t u of x at zero is negative phi prime at x plus psi prime at x is zero. And the second case is really helpful in the D'Alembert cases because that gives me a direct relationship where I know that phi prime, if I just move psi, uh, phi to the right-hand side or psi to the right-hand side, it doesn't matter. Phi prime of x equals psi prime of x, hence phi equals psi up to a constant which gives me that u of x at zero, which we had determined was phi of phi of x plus psi of x is now just two phi of x, possibly plus a constant. And that's also equal to sine pi x. And so I know that phi happens to be, I can choose the constant if I want, I'll just let it be zero. Phi of x is going to be sine pi x over two. And so knowing that phi is sine pi x over two, I, and, and, and also that phi and psi are the same, I can construct the, uh, the solution, which was u, x and t, recall was phi of x minus t, psi of x plus t. And then this is necessarily going to be sine x pi, pi x minus t, over two plus sine x plus t. Uh, there's a pi there. Sine pi x plus t over two. And so all of a sudden we have our solution. You might be you might be curious about the boundary conditions because we haven't actually used those yet. Um, but let's let's just verify. That's saying in in the uh, in the x variable they want this to be true. So if we put a zero in for x, we get uh, sine of pi times zero, which is zero, and then one in for x, we have sine of pi of one, which is still uh, 
still zero. Pi times one sine of pi is still zero. So we, we do satisfy the boundary conditions here. If the boundary conditions were something else, this is where maybe we would want to modify C right there. But that's why I like the D'Alembert solution. Um, if I scroll down here, the solution that they give is going to look a little bit different. So uh, scroll down all the way to the bottom. They get sine pi x cosine pi t. Uh, you would find out using trig identities that these are actually the same solutions. So this is actually equal to the solution I just gave, sine pi x minus t over 2 plus sine pi x plus t over 2. These are equivalent under uh, under uh, trig identities. So these are the same solution, uh, except there's just two ways to go about it. And that's the wave equation for you. So that's all I have. I'll see you in class. Bye.